All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. For those who joined us in person and also all those out virtually who are tuning in, uh, welcome. Thank you guys for coming out this afternoon. Um, a, a, a somewhat of a rare 4 p.m. show for us, which um, uh, testing out some new waters. My name is Ryan Maloney. I work in the programming department here at the museum. And on behalf of our executive director, Tracy Heider Suffern, along with our artistic directors, Christian McBride and John Batiste, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in today. Um, this, today we're presenting a program that we've been in partnership with Columbia University and the Zuckerman Institute um, for two years? Two and a half, two and a half years. We've been uh, running a very unique partnership where we explore the intersections between music and the brain. And it allows us to, we've done all kinds of things about movement and, and memory and smell and all kinds of things. So we're excited to continue that program uh, today. The curator and kind of mastermind behind these programs uh, is an outstanding pianist and band leader and composer and was the inaugural artist in residence at the Zuckerman Institute. Is that cor the correct title? Artist in residence? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we're going to kick things off. Please welcome Helen Sung. Thank you so much, Ryan. Oh my gosh, hello. It's so nice to see live people in the house here at the museum again. So happy that this wonderful place for this music is open and welcoming folks. So please stop by if you're gonna be in, this, in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> as Ryan said, today we continue our exploration of music and the brain. And um, let's start with some music before we get to the science. Uh, today, we are titling this program, it's about uh, physical movement, so I'm going to play two of my compositions to start. The first one is called Everybody's Waltz, and then f uh, something called Perpetual Motion.
Thank you, thank you. So, as I said, today is about, we're gonna look at movement. You know, obviously there's a lot of motion involved in playing a piano and, um, uh, yeah, so it's fascinating. You know, the brain to me is really the final frontier when I got to be, uh, got to do this amazing residency at the Zuckerman Institute, just something that really floored me was just the kind of research these amazing, brilliant scientists are doing and just how just, it's like really the final frontier, I feel like in some ways, just what's up here, and that blows my mind. So um, I think I'm gonna welcome our guest scientist today, the wonderful Dr. Samira Zamarut. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I think we have some Zuckerman folks in the house, but I still, I wanna hear her story about how she came to do what she's doing today. Because I remember one of, uh, another guest scientist we had, he was saying how in when he was in second grade, he would run to science class. <laughs> and I thought, that's so weird, but very <laughs> cool. <laughs> so um, tell us your life story. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure being here with you, Helen. And thank you to the National Jazz Museum for having us here today. 
Um, so as you heard, I'm, um, I work in the lab of Richard Mann at the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia University. And uh, we study walking. Um, is how I came about here is a, a long story. But um, so I was born and raised in Pakistan. And then after high school, I came here for undergrad. That was my first exposure to research. Um, and you know, um, my my dad is a, a physician, so that was like an, always an inspiration. Uh, but I didn't know there was more to science outside of medicine. And I think that my undergrad journey really opened uh, you know, so many opportunities and I just took them in. And um, my dad always encouraged me. He, he encouraged us to explore and be curious. Uh, but so he didn't want you to become a doctor? No, not really. Wow. Uh, even though I, that for me, science was all right, I'll become a medical doctor. But he was like, no, you know, discover something. Why don't you go further? Do something more interesting than this. Not that that's not interesting, <laughs> but <laughs> to him. <laughs> So uh, I think that was in the back of my mind, and when I was exposed to research, it was just, it, I was just drawn to it. And then from there, I went to grad school, where I was introduced uh, by my graduate mentor to the fruit fly, which I'll talk a lot more about today. And uh, she worked, uh, her work was genetics and dipping into neuroscience, and that's where I got, you know, got fascinated with the brain. And after that, I was like, all right, I'm going to focus more in the brain. And that's how I ended up at, uh, you know, uh, in Richard Mann's lab at the, the Zuckerman Institute, where he, uh, he also, his lab worked on walking behavior, also in the fruit fly. And so that's, that's how, here, here we are. <laughs> so why walking? Is, it, is there a um, reason other than, you know, just, I mean, this could be a movement, or blinking could be a movement, right? Because I'm sure those are very complex in their own uh, right. <laughs> yeah, all of those motor movements are very important, and there are so many researchers and scientists studying all of those aspects of movement. Uh, we're just, we're, our interest lies in walking behavior. We have, uh, Richard's lab has worked on lots of um, behavior setups very, that can allow us to study walking in flies in high resolution. Um, and so, so why flies? Because I'm like, Oh no! <laughs> I don't like flies very much to begin with. Okay, the as a rule, fly. <laughs> the humble fly. But just they yeah. have six legs, yeah. and we only have two. Well, we all know <laughs> flies, right? Fruit flies are around us, and fruits and bananas and everywhere, and we're all trying to kill them all the time. Uh, they're annoying, but we love them. They are such uh, an amazing, useful, economical model organism to ask really important scientific questions in. Um, and um, I mean, just to note, like the a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize was given to uh, research done about circadian rhythms in fruit flies. Uh, so they've really contributed a lot to advancing our understanding of how biological processes work. Um, but yeah, I mean, flies, like I said, they're economical, useful. There's, we also have a lot of techniques to like uh, manipulate uh, genetic processes in high resolution. And that gives us a big advantage on asking a lot of basic science fundamental questions and how, just how biological questions, um, you know, how biological systems work. Um, right, because I remember we had, a, we, we had a few chats, you know, leading up to this, and I was saying, well, why not something pretty like a horse? Or <laughs> She said, well, it'd take a yeah, lot yeah. of, you'd have to stable the horse and feed it. You'd need, water. yeah, you'd need a lot of land, <laughs> a lot of money, a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, well, um, maybe we can put, maybe talk about, locomotion or walking yeah. in so general. So let's, let's go to the, Alyssa, if you could start, yeah. So, so when we're talking about walking, obviously, you know, we, it's a conserved essential behavior, which we all use every single day uh, and without really understanding that it's, it's so complicated and intricate. Um, it's only when you can't walk is when you realize, right, that how important it is. But sensory motor control, obviously, that's the, the body plan of how walking is regulated is, is very intricate. And if you just go to the next an animation, um, you can see that you know it's, it's regulated by our central nervous system, which is basically our brain and our spinal cord, uh, which co constitute the, CN the central nervous system. And they organize um, this intricate uh, neural circuitry that allows information that we take in from our environment and then coordinate our limbs to then navigate and move throughout that environment. So we're taking information from our environment all the time, from our eyes, our, you know, our, we smell, we hear. All of that informa sensory information is taken into the brain by cells called neurons. And then those neurons um, 
are talking to so many other neurons to specifically then target specific parts of our bodies to allow it to, and tell it to move in very precise ways uh, in order to walk the way we need to. Um, and so not just that, but also we have information going back from our limbs back up, also again through these neurons. And so there's this constant beautiful circuit of information that, you know, there's forward information and backward information allowing us to navigate our environment as needed. Um, and so if you just go to, the, and so of course, the, you know, the purpose of trying to understand how all of this circuitry works is very important because there's a lot of uh, motor neuron diseases specifically where uh, they affect uh, our movement. And so if we can understand how the system is fundamentally laid out, it might help us in understanding uh, how to, to uh, potentially alleviate these disease processes. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Alyssa, thank you. So you were asking me about the fly and I was trying to convince you, but uh, one important thing to note is that um, it might come as a surprise, but you know, there's a lot of genetic similarity between fruit flies and humans. There's about 60% of genetic similarity, and this figure is just trying to show you that you know the colors are analogous to the kind of uh, body plan that is controlled by similar genes. And just like humans, where you see you have a brain and a spinal cord, just like that in flies, you have a brain, and instead of the spinal cord, you have something called the ventral nerve cord. Um, and again, they perform the similar function of getting information, stimuli from the environment, sending it down to the ventral nerve cord, which again, in the flies, is connected to six jointed legs. Um, and in humans, our ventral nerve cord is regulating our limbs. Um, so whatever we can learn in the flies about the, the neural circuitry of how walking is regulated can ultimately help us ask and uh, you know, understand basic questions of how uh, walking is regulated in humans or when it can go wrong, how can we address it? Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I, I'm starting to be convinced. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Um, well, you know, when I think about movement in terms of humans, I feel like the people who uh, get movement to a high art, like poets do with words, are dancers. And we are so lucky to have, um, I, I got a little grant this year to uh, do a project of my own choosing, and I met this young lady last year. She was one of our guest scientists for these programs. She's a, a Columbia grad, a, a neuro rehabilitation researcher, but also a fine dancer, a beautiful dancer, Miriam King. And please welcome her to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so this little grant we got, um, I wanted to uh, create uh, a program with her because she researches how to um, put together, would you say it's like movement classes for folks with motor issues? And it's sometimes a challenge to share them on widely because of music licensing is very expensive. So I said, well, let me write some music for this. <laughs> and um, we're gonna perform part of this for for uh, for you all now. It's We, we're, we, we wanna, incorporate it into something uh, more structured, but for now, I just want to, you to enjoy her beautiful dancing, if you want to say anything. Glimpse into the work in progress. Um, I'm so happy to be here and honored to have been invited as a scientist and now as um, a movement facilitator and incredibly honored to work with Helen. So I'm excited to show you um, what we've created kind of based on the inspiration um, the effectiveness and the healing that we've seen music and art and movement has had for our population with dementia as well as, you know, everyone. <laughs> so um, that's a little bit about the inspiration where this collaboration came from. So. So this is called Music That Moves Us. And when I was writing the music, I was thinking about Miriam and what I've seen of her dancing. So it's very much a collaborative work.
You make it look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Not by the cadence of my breath. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So um, can I, I mean, I'd love to talk a little bit about choreography. Like, how do you do that? And, yeah. you know, she's, we're still forming this piece. Yes. So it's <laughs> like she's doing it kind of on the fly, like what jazz musicians <laughs> do. So, yeah, tell us how, you know. Yeah, you so. Sound. I'm just going to. you can all join me. So <laughs> start by rubbing your hands together. Taking a nice deep inhale. Exhale, hands to your belly. A little faster. Nice deep inhale. Exhale, hands to your heart. Every portion was inspired by what we created together with the Arts and Minds program. So there was a part where there was a little bit of Latin, <laughs> and we had done a partner dance um, inspired program with them. So definitely drawing on past experiences, but also just what I consider to be the magic of your music. So I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so let's continue uh, on with your actual research and yeah. what you're doing. Absolutely. With As I was watching Crystal. Miriam dance, I was constantly thinking of all the circuitry <laughs> that's <laughs> controlling all of her, and I was just looking at her feet. So it's just amazing know. how when she jumps, it's yeah. like she's levitating <laughs> in the air almost. It's pretty amazing. So, yeah. So um, where were we? We were. I think I was telling you, trying to convince you about flies <laughs> and how they can help us answer these <laughs> questions. So. And I think when we move uh, to the next slide, we look at, you know, so flies really can help us ans answer a lot of fundamental questions about basic research, but also has a lot of translational benefits in terms of making models of human disease and really asking specific questions about uh, disease processes. Um, and so let's let's move to the next slide, Alyssa. So, and but in, in addition no, no, to- Don't play it yet, don't play it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so in addition to disease uh, as well, um, you know, this research about where we we're trying to understand neural circuitry and how uh, it controls motor movement. Um, this, whatever we, uh, ben and information that we gain from, uh, from different model organisms, and already a lot of this um, work has been uh, also been done in other model organisms, such, such as mice, et cetera. Um, it can be used to also apply to create better robots. And you know, not just robots to do your work, but like things like robotic surgery, things you know. But and this is, and if you play it now, Alyssa, you can see here is, is a robot, uh, which can uh, carry out the you know, it can move around in its environment, tackling these various obstacles, making jumps, stepping onto steps, and then you know, going on these inclines. So it's na it's able to navigate these, and these are created obviously by us, uh, by humans, not me, <laughs> but. Information that we gain from our scientific experiments can help inform uh, and create better robots. Uh, so this is great and very, very, uh, you know, impressive. But if you go to the next video, Alyssa, you are you sure there aren't people inside <laughs> that? I just no. that's <laughs> really that's really that's really yeah. amazing. It's so lifelike. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's certainly very impressive. But if you just go to the next oh video, my. it'll show you <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could do that. <laughs> That's okay. This one. Yeah. <laughs> it, so in this video, you're, you're going to see that it's still not as uh, the previous one was very impressive, but there's still a lot to be learned and improved on. Where you know when these robots, they they still cannot. <laughs> these ones especially cannot perform fine motor skills like turning a doorknob or navigating a small space or climbing on a small step. Um, they just fall and fail. So we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to. Um, Understanding the you know higher resolution, finer motor uh, motor movements and how they are laid out, how the circuitry for that is laid out in our central nervous system to control those movements. 
and our hope is, and you know, uh, the research that we do in the lab, and also obviously a lot of other people, uh, is that that we can piece together this puzzle and understand those, you know, how to improve un understanding of those finer motor skills. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Next yes. slide. So this is just showing you a, a, a little schematic of trying to, you know, when I talk about neuronal circuits, it's what I'm trying to say is you have a neuron that talks to another neuron, but it's not that simple because you can see as in the first panel, you have a neuron that talks to two, that talks to three more individually, or you can have something like you have multiple neurons talking to the same neuron. This is basically a flow of information and different ways information can flow from multiple neurons or a single neuron to other ones. And in the middle, you have a very simple setup. Um, and so this is how this complexity is what really um, enables us, uh, it, which we think is enables us to you know, perform a variety of these motor movements. And you know, the work that we do is, is trying to um, a, uncover these circuits. You know, we have neurons that we know are important in regulating the behavior that we are studying, that is walking, but exactly how are, what, who are they talking to? Or who's talking to them? Or w what are their multiple downstream partners? Or via which neuron do they perform one specific uh, motor output, like turning or you know, moving faster or taking a smaller step, or if you, you know, move your foot a certain way? Um, how, is that, how is that contributed to from these neurons? And that's what we're, we're trying to work on. Let's see I what we have next. Why you were <laughs> thinking about diverse circuits watching Miriam move. That's exactly. Just, yeah. That's a lot of different kind of movement. Yeah. And working together. And then she's also moving her arms. So there you have a lot, a lot of neural circuitry in action. <laughs> um, and then just coming back to the fly to, you know, specifically what we work on is um, to understand walking behavior. We're, in, we're interested in a very specific family of neurons called descending neurons. And just like the name implies, you can see here, uh, this is the fly, and then it's a zoom in on its central nervous system, which is the brain on the top, and the ventral nerve cord, which is again analogous to the spinal cord in humans. You can see that descent, these descending neurons that, I, that we're interested in originate in the brain and extend down into the ventral nerve cord. Uh, we know that some of these descending neurons are very important in regulating walking behavior, but exactly what they're talking to downstream in the ventral nerve cord um, uh, it, that's still uh, not completely understood and fully mapped. Um, and again, I'll also note that when you look at the ventral nerve cord, you'll see these three bulbous areas on either side. Um, and in the fly, each one is extending into one leg. So the idea is you have descending neurons coming down from the brain into the ventral nerve cord. And if it's going to one of the bulbous neuromeres, it, the bulbous area is called a neuromere, it's potentially controlling that particular leg via very intricate circuitry. Um, and so, you know, we use a variety of different techniques to, uh, to specifically uh, activate or silence these neurons and then uh, also to find out who, who they're talking to, who are their downstream partners um, in so order to... How do you do that? Because this is small. These are tiny creatures. Exactly, yeah, they're very small. And so we have uh, a lot of very, very cool imaging techniques and so I'm just going to show you a quick example here. We, um, so we have uh, very intelligent collaborators uh, who have done this amazing work up in Harvard. Um, and so what they've done is they've used this electron microscopy imaging technique, which is a very high resolution way to uh, take any biological sample um, and then section it into very, very, very thin slices and then image each section. And then that way you're not losing any, any gross detail. And so all of that information that's years of work is then put together and then we can then go into that biological tissue and start looking for neurons. And so using that complex data set, uh, you know, we can start finding neurons that we're interested in and then find it throughout this 3D biological tissue. So we're looking at a neuron there, the yeah, things that look so like lightning strikes. Exactly. So this is basically an example of one descending neuron. It's called A2. Um, and this, it, so descending neurons exist in pairs, so that's why you have one pair on either side of the ventral nerve cord, and the purple is just the, the tissue, the purple shadow. Um, and so thanks to this, this EM data set, we, we are able to not just see the descending neuron that we're interested in, but then we're also able to see what it talks to. 
So on the right side is, is just an example of one of many uh, of the partners, partner neurons that it talks to. And, um, and this is really interesting because this is in the, the very top of the VNC, which probably, which talks to the very first leg. Um, and so, and also the, the orange neuron that you see here uh, is, is a direct partner of this descending neuron. Um, and it's also interesting to us because um, it looks like a, a specific kind of neuron called a motor neuron, which is these, this family of neuron is known to, um, to regulate movement, walking or legs, right? And that reddish neuron is in one of the neural mirrors you yes, talked about earlier. Yes, exactly, yeah. Um, so this is just a starting point, you know, where now we're gonna ask what else does it talk to? And then we wanna ask, okay, so we know what it's talking to, but what does it do? Wh what does this, de this descending neuron, what, what behavior does it control through this downstream partner? So that red, reddish material, is that one motor neuron or a network of motor neurons? That would be one, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. So you do something I remember called optogen, Opti yes, optogenetics. Optogenetics. Yeah. So tell us about that. It's so interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, like I showed you, so that the first technique is very important in, 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 first of all, mapping out what it talks to. But like I said, the next question is, what does it do? What does that downstream neuron do? How is it important to walking? Um, and, you know, one of the ways we can do that is by specifically manipulating just one neuron of interest uh, in the fly and then seeing if if you manipulate one neuron, do you see a change in behavior? And that is indicative of possibly uh, a correlation or causation between uh, that behavior and that neuron regulating that behavior. Well and so I'm one way, sorry. Okay, so no, I'm, I'm sorry to remember. So it's interesting to me to hear that you're saying even when you, you're not completely sure even if that's direct cause and effect, and wh why is that just the way scientists talk to be careful about? Yeah, right, we wanna be very careful. We do lots and lots of experiments. We do multiple repeats, and we do experiments in different ways, right? So you wanna activate a neuron and see a certain behavior, but then you also wanna silence it and see if that behavior goes away. Mm. And so, you know, there's multiple avenues of testing that you need to do before you can for sure say, this is, this is these things are, ca you know, causally related. So optogenetics is basically, uh, opto it means light. So you're using light to manipulate uh, genetics. Um, and so what we do here on the, is just, is just showing a simple schematic of you have cameras on the top, you have flies walking freely in two enclosed arenas so they don't fly away, um, and you have light shining from the bottom. And um, it's really neat because the, the only way we can manipulate these genes is because we've engineered them so that they're receptive to light. And so you only engineering, engineer the one neuron that you want to activate. In this case, like I said, you would do A2 or any descending neuron you want to activate. Uh, and then you s shine light and then you analyze what happens when the light goes off versus on. You do it over and over again and you keep, you know, you, uh, you make these videos and then we have lots of computa computational methods to analyze and track the fly's movements over time you know, see whether it's walking faster, slower, is it taking more steps, fewer steps, is it, you know, pausing more often, is it turning, what's its speed of turning? So lots of high resolution parameters that we can then analyze and then, you know, start to ask questions about is this related to the neuron that we uh, manipulated. So when you manipulate the gene, is it different genes but it's always red light? Or That's a great question. So it's, it depends on the nature of the genetics that we've done. So some some uh, some genes are engineered with uh, tools that will be receptive to red light. So in this case, this is actually receptive to red light. We have tools where we can use a uh, different color of light, like green, to uh, silence neurons. It all depends on the genetics of the tool that you've introduced. But the um, color is up to the discretion of the scientist. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. It, it, oh, that's no. up to the, <laughs> the biology of the engineering oh, tool really? that you've used. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I think you're going to show us something. Yes. Yeah. So this is just an example by, uh, of work done by other scientists. It's really cool, which is showing uh, what happens when you know, activate this one neuron called moonwalker descending neurons, which promote backward walking. So on the right side, you'll see a fly walking just normally. It's, it's not manipulated in any way, but on the um, on the, sorry, this is my right. Can you play that again? Yeah. Um, on the far side, you'll see this fly is constantly walking backwards because in this, it's been engineered uh, such that the, only that moonwalker descending neuron is activated. 
and when, whenever it's activated, it'll keep walking backwards. Of course, when you, when you stop the activation stimulus, it'll stop walking backwards. But it's fascinating because with these experiments, they were able to make this correlation, uh, association, where they could say that, yes, this one descending neuron, when you activate it, it promotes backward walking, which is, which is just amazing. And the hope is that we can do more of these and you know, find more descending neurons or more downstream partners and associate these specific motor behaviors to them to like, understand the puzzle of the circuitry. That is amazing, Samara. Well, I'd like to just, you know, we, we talk about sensory input from our environment that affects our movement. So um, we're gonna start off with some visual um, input, I guess. So wh what, how do you wanna move if you went home and saw that? Anybody? If you're sleeping on the sofa, you open your <laughs> eyes and you see a bear walking in your front door. <laughs> huh? Run away. <laughs> you know, it was so funny because when I was looking for images like this, like the bear, the images were always blurry. I said, why can't somebody take a better picture of that? And I said, oh, because they're running away. <laughs> okay, next image. Any physical movement come to mind when you see that? Anybody? Yeah, get close. I, I want to touch and feel the pedals. Yeah, all right, the next one. <laughs> I think it make my skin crawl. Just try to not scream. <laughs> yes, try to not scream. Yeah, so instead of shining red or green lights, I, I think it's good you said red and green, you know, in the holidays. But we're not going to shine lights on you guys, but we're going to shine some music. And um, uh, it's if you feel inspired to actually move, I think you should feel free, but I think we're also gonna invite Miriam back mm -hmm. to the stage and she can help be the, the leader if you know we can get shy in these situations, so. Okay, so I'm gonna play some music and if you guys, you know, there's plenty of room, so feel free to move how, how, you, how you feel led. Yeah, so that was a very light, joyful, um, reminded me of ice skating. <laughs> it's called skating, so I'm not sure what you're going on. You probably do that every week. Okay. Uh, Carter Winger? Absolutely.
What a beautiful wedding, yes. <laughs> Actually, so we did this activity for our Arts and Minds group, and today the most beautiful moment happened. Um, one of our couples uh, brought their wedding photo to the Zoom camera um, that they had just dug out to reminisce, and it was just the best. <laughs> Sneaky and cheeky. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so, you know, I think dance is something very just uh, fundamental in human experience throughout history, and we're going to uh, celebrate the, the, I think, this program with, I think, as I said at the beginning, to me, dancers, they make movement art. You know, so before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how flies might dance. <laughs> yeah, flies. Uh, well, flies do a song and dance. Um, interestingly, flies are actually there's lots of social behaviors exhibited by flies and studied very well. And again, you know, there's uh, intricate neural circuitry that controls all of those behaviors as well. And so, just just a last video that I'd like to share with you. Um, uh, just a second, just let me just um, introduce this. Um, so this is basically, again, this is research done by many other groups um, about Drosophila courtship. And it's very interesting because it's highly stereotyped um, and has a very specific sequence of events that's uh, carried out mostly by the male, but also by the female uh, in order to court, in order to court them. And uh, as you'll see in this, in this sequence of events, uh, it's, it's really cool. There's a whole song and dance that uh, the male does <laughs> to court the female. Is he starts by you know, tapping the female. First, he's, he orients himself. Um, we're all uh, over 17 here, so it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's just a joke. It's, it's not. <laughs> um, so you'll see that the fly orients itself first uh, to you know, see the, uh, the female. And then it's going to start tapping and chasing the fly. It'll start chasing it more actively. Again, there's there's this specific tapping movement, you know, done to 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 gain the female fly's attention. The black the f the male is the one with the black bottom, um, and then it's going to actively chase the female. There's a run after run after <laughs> the female there. She's running away. She's still debating. <laughs> Um, and then it's going to try harder. It's going to do this song with by moving its its wing in in a specific uh, rhythm um, to gain the fly, a female's attention. And then it's doing. And this is the female now. It's it's. Uh, I've heard that, and I've read that this is a sign of approval and their success. <laughs> and then the 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 male gains what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, this is just to show an example of a very stereotyped set of events that occurs in this, in the, in for, you know, uh, a simple mo model like uh, in flies to court females. Um, and again, the circuitry for this has also been studied in detail. Each one of those specific movements is, is a motor movement where a set of motor movements, you know, the tapping, um, the, the beating of the wings, that song, and then, you know, followed by, you know, the, the female's approval with the tapping of the middle legs again. Um, that's all the sequence of events that needs to occur. And again, very specific neural circuitry, which has also been studied. Um, some descending neurons, again, are also important here that play an important part in carrying out this whole thing. And if you, if you disrupt one of the components of the circuitry, it does affect the end result as well. 
Wow. Samara, thank you so much for sharing your amazing expertise with us. And I'm just reminded of something you said near the beginning of the program that, you know, it's like something like walking. We don't think about it. We take it for granted until we might not be able to walk or have like, what if we broke our ankle or something like that. But just then you th start thinking about walking and what an incredibly complex process it is in our, our bodies that happens to me, it feels I don't instantaneous, right? And I just think science is so amazing that you guys are studying the the the, the nuts and bolts of that. It's it's like art too. It's like it's amazing. Um, well, I I, I want to end with our artist of movement <laughs> and want to encourage you guys. You know, y'all have sat there the whole program very nicely and listened, but we want to encourage y'all to move and. Uh, Maybe you can tell them a little bit about this last piece and um, maybe let's explore a little bit about just the intricacy, intricacy and connectedness of our own bodies. Like, you know, we think about just when we move, it's not just a matter of our feet moving. There's a whole host of things going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're definitely going to do a fun social dance. So you're welcome to dance in your chair, dance in your vicinity or migrate this way. <laughs> Um, and yeah, one of the things in our wonderful planning discussions connecting the science and the music and the movement um, was really this idea that everything is connected within us and between us. So um, from you know, the actual movements and the brain circuitry that has to communicate for movement to happen, but also um, moving with other people in space and throughout life um, and other organisms too. So that's sort of uh, <laughs> one of my favorite elements of today's event that I really has stuck with me. Um, so I invite you all to think about that while you're moving, how the music feels in your own body, um, how it feels to move with people in a space as safely as we can with COVID. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's get started. thank Dr. Samara Zamarut from the Zuckerman Institute, Miriam King, neurorehabilitation researcher and dancer. We want to thank the Zuckerman Institute for their partnership in this and also our host for today, the National Jazz, Jazz, National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Thank you for joining us. I don't, should I send it back to Ryan or are we signing off? Okay, we're good. <laughs> Take care of yourselves. Think about it as we move around. Goodbye, good night, bye.